Hello and welcome to a special edition of TV44's Faith and Friends. This is part one of a two-part series, Memories of Ron Mile. He was the man behind the vision of TV44. When others said it couldn't be done, Ron Mile heard God's voice and continued onward toward the goal. Last fall, the broadcasting world and TV44 said goodbye to Ron as he left his earthly home, but doing so for something much better. Without a doubt, he has left a legacy, and thanks to his 50-plus year career in broadcasting, many have come to know Christ thanks to Ron Mile's vision. We now bring you part one of Memories of Ron Mile. My dad had not been well for quite a while, and there is, during those times it's easy to forget the better times. And my parents made tremendous sacrifices over the years. As you know, many were more costly than they expected, and some required more than they could even afford to give. These last few weeks have been filled with wondrous notes and conversations and encouragement that's just detailing the impact that Ron and Becky had on this area and in others' lives. And there is beautiful power in those words. So thank you. There's no doubt that we're going to see my dad again when we're united in heaven. And not to be flippant, but I can just picture if there are conversations that happen in front of a pearly gate, that my dad would be standing there with Paul Harvey or someone saying, you know, if they put a motor on that gate, this, this would work a lot faster. They could get people in, and uh, we could put a remote on the throne. We'd, we'd have it all worked out. When my dad died, there were a lot of unsatisfied curiosities that died with him. When, uh, when we could talk, he always had something new he was working on or dismantling or imagining. And we're talking about a guy who had a drill press in his home office. A drill press. Why, I don't know. And I stopped asking why a long, long time ago. But my dad could fix almost anything. And he understood how combinations of parts could work together and he could, he could begin dismantling it while he's watching it work. It was, it was amazing how his mind worked. And he passed some of those problem solving skills on to each of his kids. I mean, my, my older brother, Todd, he is in charge of two Air Force base flight lines in Germany. Uh, my sister, Jenny, she has renovated countless uh, investment properties. My younger brother, Chad, is an amazing carpenter and, and woodworker. And uh, I'll miss sending pictures of, my, uh, of unusual things to my dad. I, I, I saw a red box, you know, where you get the movies? I saw one of those open, and I took a picture of it because I knew he'd want to see what's inside there. And if you didn't know, it's a little man that lives in there named Jerry. He just pokes movies at the... No, I'm just kidding. His name's Rico. So. But my dad was a lot of fun. Uh, every Christmas, he would pull out a 16-millimeter film uh, projector, and he'd go to the Lionel Public Library and rent Babes in Toyland. And we'd watch Laurel and Hardy's Babes in Toyland on a 16-millimeter projector and laugh at the same old gags and things. And that, that song, uh, the song that's in there, it's, you know, Toyland. If, you know, once you leave its borders, you can never go back again. But uh, my dad never really left Toyland. He, uh, he had a unique ability to find joy in fun little things. And he wasn't embarrassed to share it. He, uh, when the grandkids would get together, he would always have something unusual. It's like, he, it's like he had a subscription to Sky Mall for odd people or something. <laughs> it was amazing. He's, he's the type of guy where or you'd find a spider web and you'd think, oh, a spider web. Well, he would think, oh, well, let's go find a bug and put it in the spider web. And think, okay, no, let's tie a string around the bug and put it in the spider web and then pull it out and then put it back in and pull it out. No, let's get another spider and put it on this spider spider web and see what happens. And it, you know, the grandkids are around and... In case you don't know, that other spider wants to get off of that web really quickly. So just in case you ever wanted to try that. But when the, the start of TV44 began, it was actually in our dining room at a roll-top desk. And the first meetings of WTLW were uh, on the phone with a phone line that was one digit off from the Lima Police Department. So we'd get these calls, hey, do you have Roscoe locked up down there? And after not long, you know, my mom would answer the phone, uh, let me check. No, we don't have Roscoe locked up down here. Thank you very much. But people were drawn to my dad, partly because he shook things up. He always had a new idea, always had a new idea. And now that same mindset could drive me crazy or make me angry. But in the end, he could almost always make me laugh. 
And the day before my dad died, we talked about what was about to happen, and, and he knew it was his time to go. And I asked him, I said, are you scared? And he said, nope. He said, I'm very, very curious. Thank you again for being here tonight. God bless you. They say that heaven's pretty And living here is too But if they said that I would have To choose between the two I'd go home Going home where I belong. Sometimes when I'm dreaming, it comes as no surprise that if you look and see that homesick feeling in my eyes, I'm going home. Going home where I belong. While I'm here, I'll serve Him gladly, and I'll sing Him all these songs. I'm here, not for long. I'm headed home, going home where I belong. While I'm here, I serve Him gladly and I sing Him all these songs. I'm here, not for long. I'll be sleeping when death knocks on my door and I'll awake to find that I'm not homesick anymore cause I'll be home I'll be home where I belong Well, it's good to see everybody here tonight, and uh, it's just a joy to see some of these people we haven't seen in a long, 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 long time and, and hear everybody sing again. And remember a man who brought us all together. I mean, he's bringing us together again tonight. Uh, he brought us together back then. <clears throat> but uh, Ron was fond of saying that he, he's, he was not the only one who was called to start Christian television in, in Northwest Ohio. He's just the one who said yes. And he, and, and he did meet, uh, Becky might correct me, he did meet uh, later on somebody who, who uh, believed that they were called to start Christian television. They said no. And so uh, West Central Ohio, Northwest Ohio, Indiana, Michigan has a big debt uh, of gratitude to, to Ron Mile for Christian television. And not just 44, but uh, WLMB. Now, a lot of you were there at the beginning, and I'm going to introduce some of you a little bit later on, but some of you actually were out there pounding on the roof and, and, uh, and pounding on the pouring concrete and things like that. I just saw Manley Johnson back there, and Don Ritchie's already gone home to be with the Lord, but Larry Ware, and just a whole lot of people. But Ron could do, and I think John, John Ondo coined, coined this phrase, that w, WTLW would do more with nothing than anybody, right? I think John coined that a long time ago. But Ron could do more with nothing than anybody. Uh, if you drive by there today, it's an amazing TV station. And it's still going strong. WLMB is an amazing station, still going strong. But it started with a, a used tower. Uh, I think a used antenna, I'm not sure. Definitely a used, a used, a used uh, transmitter. An old beat up building that wasn't worth anything had birds flying through it. Uh, everything was used. And, and he started with a bunch of people who didn't know anything except for Roger Rhodes about television. 
I think even Keith Curtis was, was radio, so only one person knew anything about television, and that was Roger Rhodes. He's here tonight if you want to say hi to him. But Ron started, I think he had the faith of George Mueller. A little bit is everything if God's in it. I mean, if God is in it, Ron said, that's, that's it. He wanted to do something that was, that was so big that if God wasn't in it, it was destined to fail. And uh, that's why today WLMB is still in Toledo. WTLW is still down the road here on Beatty Road. WTGN is still, still broadcasting the good news because it wasn't just Ron, but he knew who his savior was and he knew that he was called. He's the first person I ever really worked for, that I ever met, I think. I knew a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers, but Ron was the first man I ever met that I, I could say without a doubt, he is called to do exactly what he's doing. He was called, and there was no way you were going to convince him otherwise. He was called to do that. Uh, a lot of people told him Christian television isn't for today. Christian television isn't, isn't possible. You can't do it with a gift-supported station. I think when we went to our first NRB, there was 80 Christian television stations in the, in the country. You remember, Kevin? I, I think there was 80. Most of those television stations are gone today. I mean, even Chicago's gone, a lot, most of them are gone. These stations are still here today because it's, it's, it's by God and by God's grace. And Ron knew that. He loved broadcasting. I don't think he liked the business too much, but he loved broadcasting. And uh, he brought people in and, and surrounded him with people that, uh, that knew the other parts of that. But the, the thing that was so great uh, to be around at that time was that, that he loved the creativity of young people. They had, didn't have to know anything about television, but he loved young people who were creative, and he cut them loose to go do their thing. And he let them do their thing. And sometimes he made huge mistakes. I mean, there was a revolving stage. There was, <laughs> there, there was, but uh, the, the, it was the, the kind of the simple things that used to really amaze him. And it was, the, the big thing was the tote board. It was before you could buy chaser lights for Christmas trees. And I think it was Ron and Larry Ware and maybe Nelson Augsburger and probably Dwight Wisner and somebody else that created this tote board that the lights would chase each other around the, around the tote board when we, we reached our goal. And Ron loved that. It was a big, big thing. He really loved that. But before he got into TV, he was in radio, and that's where the, the initial dollars were raised for WTLW. It was through WTGN. And Scott, you want to come and share some of that? Yeah, it's, and as I thought about this a little bit, I think in some ways it's, people almost forget that Ron was a part of WTGN. He was there for 13 years. And I can remember when I came, he'd been there 11 years. And I thought, I can't believe that somebody would actually be at one radio station for that long. And I've now been there for like 36 years. And uh, Ron did bring some uh, innovation to some of the things there. I don't know how many people know it, but WTGN was the first 24-hour radio station in Lima. So that's cool, huh? In the volunteer program. And, and I, how many former volunteers do we have here? Yeah, a lot of people. And the volunteers were just great with the big family radio reels that, well, yeah, the big family radio reels. We'll just kind of leave it at that. I uh, first met Ron in 1978 when I came out to interview for the station. And I wish I could tell you all the things associated with it, but it, let me just kind of hit a couple of points on it. One of the things was that uh, when he brought me into the room, basically he worked me over pretty good. I've been interviewed by a number of people, and Ron's was very, very intense. And one of the things that he talked a lot about was the gospel. And that, that seems kind of weird, but we talked a lot about that. And he had me give a gospel presentation back to him as if I was on the radio. And the reason he told me that he did that was because they had been vacationing somewhere. We'll, we'll pick it. We'll, let's pick on Michigan. We, we don't like Michigan anyway, right? So they were listening to a Christian radio station up in Michigan for like five or six days, and they never, ever heard the gospel message. And so that was something that as far as TGN was concerned, that we really incorporated that uh, for all of us to share. But after we had interviewed quite extensively that day, he said, well, hey, uh, what are you doing about supper? And uh, do you like pizza? I said, yeah, I like pizza. And so we went over to their house. You guys lived on Bryce, right? Bryce and Collett. I remember sitting on the porch there and hanging out with them and meeting their four darling children, two of which are here tonight. And um, we had Chuck's Pizza. And a funny thing happened. We, were had, the, we had the pizza. It's never happened to me since. I'm eating it, and we're outside, and I don't know if it's the wind or whatever, but it takes a piece of the pizza, and it gets it into my eye. And here I'm trying to get this pizza crust or whatever out of my eye. And I told Ron about it. He says, yeah, we usually wear goggles when we eat pizza. But uh, we're going to go. But I can remember even as I was there that night looking out over 
over Bryson Collett and spending time with him, I thought, you know what, I could work with this guy. That would be great to be working with him. I loved his humor. I loved his passion, his creativity, the mad scientist. Who, ever, who else has a thing where you can do soft drinks in your, living, you know, in your kitchen like that? You know, and just different things like that. I'd never seen it before. And the Lord obviously did bring me there, and we had some great times. And Mary Nungester is here tonight. I know Keith is going to be on the video. Uh, John Marshall was a part of that, and, of course, me and Ron. And I remember one time we went out to the Mustard Seed Coffee House. Anybody remember the Mustard Seed Coffee House? And I remember everybody... But me, who doesn't play an instrument, did their thing. Ron did the ukulele. Keith played the guitar. Uh, John Marshall was a trumpeter. And Miriam played the piano. And then we sang together, Turn Your Radio On, Get In Touch With God. And it was just fun. It was particularly good for me because those three guys could sing and they just kind of covered me up. You know, and I preached that night because I didn't do an instrument. But that was at the old airport. And if, 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 if my memory serves me, I think something else happened there a little bit later on, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it's called a, t a TV station. I got on the radio having been healed of stuttering just two weeks before. And uh, I went through the worst interview anyone has ever had in the history of man. Uh, are you a writer? Uh, no, I, I didn't do that well in English. I was a, I was a freshman in Bible school. Are you... Uh, uh, are you, uh, let's see, an engineer? I think he had four things. Uh, are, <laughs> are, uh, are you an announcer? I said, no, I've only been talking for two weeks. <laughs> he looked at me and said, it was strange. He thought I was pulling his leg. No, I was trying to get out of there. And he says, well, if we, if we ever run across uh, a need uh, and, and you can fill it, we'll call you. I thought, boy, if that isn't a goodbye. And I, I stood up, I stand 6'1", and he stood about five foot. And I think I intimidated him a little bit. And I said, I looked down at him and I said, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. He got a little puffy and he says, as if to say, oh yeah, you watch me refuse. <laughs> and I, he says, what is it? And I said, this place is a mess. Now we were right in the studios of this FM station in San Francisco. This is, it needs a good cleaning. And I'm going to be your volunteer janitor. And he just looked at me for a long second and he said, you're right, I can't refuse that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was just a, a unique time meeting in that, uh, in that TV station, well it wasn't a TV station, it was an airport hangar. And sometimes the heat was on, sometimes it wasn't, and uh, uh, it was just just amazing, amazing. Uh, you'd mentioned uh, Scott mentioned the uh, the soda fountain. First time Tammy and I ever went, we, we went to to dinner at, at Becky's house. She was a gracious hostess, had us over. I think we had spaghetti or something like that. And Ron says, uh, uh, "You want what do you want to drink?" And I said, "I'll take a. You got a Coke?" He says, yeah, and he goes over to, over to the faucet, and he turns on this, this faucet, and he's got Coke syrup in this thing, and he's, and he's making a, a soda fountain Coke at the, at the kitchen sink. And, and we, we started home, and Tammy says, can I have one of those? And she's, she still, to this day, is asking me to do I said, I'm not Ron Mile. I can't build that. I don't know anything about plumbing or electrical or whatever it takes to do that. He's got a big cylinder in his basement. It could blow up at any time. You don't want that down there. But she still wants that, Becky. She wants to do that with orange juice or something like that. But, but he could do more with nothing than anybody. But Ron had the faith of George Mueller. I think he had the evangelistic heart of a Billy Graham. Uh, he could tell a story better than... Uh, who's the guy on Pray Home Companion? Garrison Keillor. He could tell a story better than Garrison Keillor. You listen to him sometimes. He had great stories. He had the humor of, 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 of a Mark Twain. But uh, I think he was as inventive as, as Edison and Bell. But I told Becky one time that uh, uh, working at TV44, going to work there, was like, like uh, go working in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory with the babes in Toyland being led by the Wizard of Oz. I mean, it was just, it was, you never knew what was going to happen that day. And sometimes you get frustrated. But the day they put the antenna up, Miriam will remember this, the day they put the antenna on top of that tower, we drove out there and there was cars lined up along Beatty Road. And, and I drove up there and I'm going like this and Ron says, no, no, he says, lay on your back, take these binoculars, lay down on the ground, lay right there and says, then you get the best shot of that antenna going on top of that tower. 
but all the used equipment we had all those years, but the faith was amazing. And uh, just over and over again, uh, I, I, I look, think back the day that I, I heard that he passed, Lyman News called up, and I didn't know anything about it, and they asked me for a statement. I thought, I, I don't know what to say. I didn't know that he had passed away. But that morning, that night, in the middle of the night, it must have been about 3 o'clock in the morning, it just, the Lord woke me up, and it's just one memory after another just started flooding back of all the fun we had. He was a fun guy to work with. It was, uh, I mean, it's frustrating at times, but he was just really a lot of fun. So uh, who's up here next? John's coming up. But we talked about what Ron did for young people. Um, my son's an example of it. He's got a job in broadcasting today because of, because of Ron Mile. Uh, this guy shows up on a bicycle, and uh, I don't know what he went, went, to, went to from there, but he's, he's doing something now in Columbus. But anyway, John was one of those people that, uh, that Ron took under his wing and said, just go ahead and do what you want to do. And John's been able to do that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it was just about five years ago when I was 15 that I rode my bike up to TV 44. Don't do the math. Um, I... Uh, went there because I had a love for broadcasting and and when I got there TV 44 became my second family and at the head of that family was Ron Mile. Um, the thing about Ron was I, I came to the station not really knowing Christ I didn't know a whole lot about that whole religion thing and uh, but Ron loved broadcasting and I loved broadcasting and he connected with me at that level and um, I know as time went on and uh, began to work with him and if you knew his old office he had a whole rack of uh, old microphones on there um, and I would uh, you know only thing I need to do to kill like a half an hour at work would just hey Ron did you hear uh, Station of Seattle change their call letters oh really John come on in and we're in a half hour discussion about call letters transmitter transmitters, tower construction, the old days of television. Um, he loved that stuff, and, and that's what just really drew me to him so much is that here is this guy who was so in love with the Lord, but yet into broadcasting, and that was so cool, and that's what really drew me in. Um, he, it was not just you know radio and television. He wasn't into other things, and there's not enough time to go through all the things he loved, although you should ask Becky about how air traffic above a Montana airport was stopped once by a paraplane that Ron was flying. <laughs> that is true. The story I want to share with you, though, about Ron is a personal one that is um, uh, one that has nothing to do with broadcasting. Um, and Bob and I attended the Emanuel United Methodist for a while, and they always had these great men's retreats that we would go on, and a bunch of us, I think, went to a, a few of them, and Ron uh, attended one with us. And typically, the, uh, uh, the method of, uh, of the schedule is that Friday night, there's what's called a foot washing service. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a very humbling experience for the person who is served. It's a very humbling uh, experience for the person who, who does the foot washing. And, um, and I was there that night with Ron, and he came up, and with the bullet says, John, I want to wash your feet. And uh, that's just not fair, Ron. You're the guy who's let, you know, really played a big part of leading me to Christ. You've given me all these tools as a broadcaster and as somebody who's doing what he's passionate about. Why are you washing my feet? Um, yet when I was thinking about things after, uh, after Ron went to be with the Lord, I thought, what a, what a picture of Ron that is. He was a servant, and he knew better than anyone, and I, I use this tool now, and I think we all do as I look over this family of ours here, is he understood that the best way to communicate the gospel is to serve the community. That's the best way to change it is to serve it. And, and boy, you know, I, I've been in many other places, but I'll tell you what, I don't remember a meeting one time that was ever heard, we need to protect my ministry, or we need to send out this thing to protect this, or this station's mine, and da-da-da-da-da. It was never his. It's always been ours. It's always been, it still stands today because he had set it up in this way that it was never about him. It was always about sharing the gospel and, um, and, 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 and taking care of people and sharing and serving. And that is uh, indelibly etched with me. Um, Becky and the family, you guys sacrificed a lot uh, following his vision. You guys are like family to me, and I thank you for all you've ever done, because when you look at results for Ron Mile, I'm one of them. Um, so thank you. My name is Lisa Kraler. Back then it was Bowers. And 
you know, it's really hard to just narrow it down to one or two things about Ron because every day was an adventure with him. And, but as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how he gave people the benefit of the doubt and he gave people a chance. We talked about how young people came through there. People didn't have broadcast degrees. They were just happy to have people. <laughs> and they gave people a chance. And he gave me a chance. And I remember in 1985, I was a telephone, telethon producer, and I said, Ron, can we bring in a younger band? I mean, the Gaithers are okay, but can we try to reach a younger audience in the telethon? He said, okay, we'll give it a shot. I found a band out of Philadelphia, found free. And their photos looked normal. Their music sounded good. Ron said, okay. The day they were going to sing, I walked into the station. Someone said, have you seen the band? And I said, oh, they're here. And they said, have you seen the band? And then this guy with a purple mohawk walked down the hallway, and I thought, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> and someone said, hey, Ron's looking for you. He wants you to come to his office. <laughs> We're in the middle of a cornfield in northwest Ohio. Those kind of things just didn't happen here. So I went into his office. But Ron always had this boyish, boyish smirk that he would give you, and his eyebrows would raise. And he said, have you seen the band? I said, they don't look the same as their pictures. <laughs> and I said, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to go on with the show. We're going to let them sing. We're going to give them a chance. And it was an awesome night. If you were there, if you remember, um, yeah, they were very different. But they spoke to so many people. And we had a lot of young people call in that night and accept the Lord. And it was an amazing night. And Ron gave him a chance. And at the end of the night, I remember, you know, how he would look at the camera and he'd say, come in a little closer. And he talked about how we often judge people on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And tonight he was looking at the heart. And these people made a difference in the lives of a lot of people. And, of course, I was thrilled that this band was allowed to be there because ended up they invited me to go on a Christian music cruise. And I met my husband on that cruise 28 years ago. And uh, so I have really good memories of that. But Ron was somebody that was open to new things. As you know, we hear about these adventures, the risks he took. But he gave people the benefit of the doubt because he loved people. And I just want to say, Becky, thank you so much for standing with him over the years. Um, you meant a lot to me, too. And uh, it meant a lot to a lot of people. And you went through a lot. And Matt, Jenny, um, we love you. And we're going to be praying for you. And we're thank so thankful to the Lord for the great things that God did through Ron um, because he was willing. We love you. Thank you for joining us for Memories of Ron Mile Part 1. We also want to thank those of you who have donated TV44 recently in Ron Mile's name. Without a doubt, his legacy and vision lives on. Well, next week, in place of Faith and Friends again, we bring you Ron Memories of Ron Mile Part 2. Until then, have a great week and Merry Christmas, everyone.